We now come to new clause 2, with which it will be convenient to consider new clauses 3, 5, 7, 11 and 13. Stephen Bartlett to move new clause 2. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In speaking to new clause 2, which I will not be pressing to a vote, uh, I wish to really follow the, uh, the line of argument that uh, my rightful friend, the member for Wokings, uh, pursued on the previous clause, new clause 9 where he drew the attention of the House to the tension of building up capital whilst also lending more and used the analogy of driving with one foot on the accelerator and one foot uh, on the brake. Well, if I may, Mr Deputy Speaker, take a step out of the car. In essence, what we have with New Clause 2, which I try to draw attention to the House, is a similar tension, an unintended, I'm sure, tension. Well, we are taking a positive step forward in the very welcome uh, announcement in the government's response to the Banking Commission report today, in which they say at paragraph 2.13, 2.14, that they accept the premise of reversing the burden of proof, but in doing so adopt, if I can say, a potential handicap, a step back in the report from the Banking Commission. Uh, pertaining to paragraphs 117 and 1171, in which a new condition is attached to using that burden of proof, whereby a successful enforcement action must have been concluded by the regulator prior to using that new tool. I don't think, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, there can be any doubt as to the merits of reversing the burden of proof. What's very clear is that the requirement on the regulator to sift through reams of emails looking for evidence to incriminate a senior banker is both a timely and costly exercise and indeed one where it's highly likely that it will fail because senior executives are not so stupid as to write the sort of boastful, willful emails that we saw from some of the LIBOR traders where they bragged of having their bottles of bolly. Most senior executives are wise to the risks of their emails and will not therefore fall into such a trap. And so it is proportionate and reasonable to, accept, to argue that those senior executives who say that their hands-on leadership is sufficient to justify very high individual bonuses should also as individuals be able to meet the other side of the coin and to demonstrate they, they have personally acted reasonably. And so I think today's announcement from the government is extremely welcome, that they will be reversing the burden of proof. But it does open up, as I say, from the acceptance of paragraph 1171 of the Banking Commission report, a real impediment, because if you open the door to personal enforcement, why would a chief executive wish to settle on behalf of their firm. And so the very act that we're seeking to fix, to make it easier for the regulator to be able to focus in, in a time efficient and cost effective manner, on the individuals to be held responsible, is going to be impeded by this additional requirement, whereby enforcement must be concluded against the firm. And so the very senior leadership we want to target through this uh, amendment today will actually be incentivized to drag out proceedings and impede any settlement with the firm. Now I don't believe that will be the intention of the government uh, in bringing forward this bill but through new clause 2 I seek to draw the Minister's attention so that in the other place this issue can be discussed in more detail and it can uh, be tackled. The reason this amendment is so important is I do not share uh, the confidence of some colleagues who have spoken earlier in the debate on the ability of criminal sanctions to operate effectively. I think it's a very welcome tool to have. I think many of our constituents would like to see the golden handcuffs replaced by the prison variety. And indeed, when you see the imagery on US television of white collar uh, arrests and convictions, it does have a very powerful deterrent effect. But my concern is if you look at the individual fines and enforcement that have been taken to date, 
the regulator has struggled to reach the evidential level required to successfully prosecute individuals. And yet we're suggesting with this amendment that they will be able to meet a higher standard of proof in order to secure criminal convictions. It's a bit like asking a hurdler who has just failed at one level to actually jump over a bar that is much higher. And so the reversal meets one aspect. The criminal sanctions meets another in terms of deterrence. It has the power of the headline. But the question is, will it fall into the trap that so often happens in this House, Mr. Deputy Speaker, which we pass legislation that sounds tough, but in practice proves very difficult to use. And my fear is the standard of proof required of regulators to deliver a criminal prosecution will be such that it will be at all very rarely used. And therefore we need to look at how we target the individual, because in targeting the individual and not the firm, we will drive the culture of firms. For example, at present, where there is wrongdoing, the firm will quickly settle. They get a 30% discount as soon as they settle. The junior staff, the heads of division that are responsible are quickly exited. And the senior staff can therefore claim willful blindness because the most controversial briefings are usually done orally. So reversing the burden will address part of the ill. But what I am seeking to move with this new clause too is to draw attention to the limits of fines on firms, which at the end of the day, Mr. W. To speak, of penalise shareholders, they penalise pension funds, they penalise the very same constituents that are also paying again in terms of the bailout. bailout. So our constituents are paying twice for the bailout and then through the impact in terms of their shareholding. And so that's why I would resist the temptation, however uh, siren the voices to follow the US model of much higher fines, even though the government amendment, much welcome amendment, whereby fines now go to good causes, unlike with the party opposite, where fines bizarrely went to the benefit of other banks. So the more banks behaved badly, the more other banks uh, benefited, which was a bizarre uh, incentive to have from the regulatory model that in place by the shadow chancellor. So I very much welcome that we have fixed that element but it is still the case that high fines against firms invariably punish the shareholders and not the senior executives responsible. Likewise, when FISMA was first brought through this House and very, uh, debated over many hours uh, in this chamber, it was felt that reputational harm was a deterrent for firms. Indeed, FISMA made specific reference to the fact that firms should be named as if that would have some sort of impact on customers, that customers would be so, sh so shocked by the bad behaviour of a specific bank that they would take their business as well. well. I think it's reasonable to conclude, Mr Deputy Speaker, that shame has not had the effect that perhaps was intended. Uh, indeed, when we have executives uh, naming their horses uh, fat cat in the hat, uh, then it's very clear that shame is not a deterrent. So, New Clause 2 seeks, Mr Deputy Speaker, to build on a fix the government has already put in place to reverse the burden of proof. It is more modest in its objective than the aspiration for criminal sanctions. Attractive though those are, but in practice, I fear, limited in their application. But it also seeks to address a potential flaw in what was otherwise, I think, a first-class piece of work in the Banking Commission report, whereby there will be a disincentive potentially on executives to settle any enforcement action against their firm if in doing so it leaves themselves open to individual fines. We need to address not more laws but the culture within banks and financial services. We pay senior executives in those institutions to assess risk. If the highest fine associated with the 08 banking collapse, as is the case, is less than the bonus of those executives in the preceding year, then it's logical that executives will assess that risk, the risk of being caught and the risk of a, a, a paltry fine, and, and assess that to be a risk 
worth taking. And if the penalty then is against the firm and not them as individuals, then that will further embolden those executives in taking risks which they personally benefit from. It is for that reason, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I seek to draw the Minister's attention to the opportunity offered in New Clause 2 to reverse the burden of proof, but to do so without condition, so that we can hit those responsible for future failure where it hurts most, personally, in their pockets. New Clause 2, burden of proof, persons performing significant influence functions. The question is that the clause be read a second time.